Welcome to the Chemistry, Biology and Math Revision Hub. Today we're doing the scientific article for October 2023. These are the potential questions for Biology Unit 5. So here we have two articles. There is the first, which I'm going to read first, and then I'll go to the second one. So this is about your second skin. They say the 19th century anatomist, Eramos Wilson, called this tissue, now known as fascia, a natural bandage. In this section, that is exactly what it looks like. Sheets of white fibrous connective tissue that are strong yet flexible and perfect for keeping muscles and organs in place. They are also sticky, gloopy, and get in the way of looking at the muscles, bones, and organs they cover, which explains why, for years, anatomists cut this tissue off, chucked it away, and thought little more about it. In paragraph 2, they say recently though, researchers have begun to take a fresh look at first year and are finding that it is anything but an inert wrapping. Instead, it is the site of biological activity that explains some of the links between lifestyle and health, it may even be a new type of sensory organ. There appears to be more going on in the first year than is commonly appreciated, says Carl Lewis at Cornell University in Ithaca, New York. In paragraph 3, one difficulty with studying first year is that there is disagreement about what it actually is. It comes under the umbrella of connective tissue, which, at its broadest definition, includes not only tendons, ligaments, but also bone, skin, and fat. Paragraph 4. Most fascia researchers, however, understand it to be sheets of tissue made up of strong collagen fibers and more stretchy elastin fibers. In many places, these fibrous sheets are separated by areolar or loose fascia, a form that contains fewer fibers, and with the gaps between fibers filled with a slimy substance that allows the surrounding layers to slide over each other. The main ingredients of this slippery soup are hyaluronic acid for lubrication, and proteoglycans, molecules that provide cushioning. The fascia fibers and the soup are both secreted by specialized cells in the tissue, fibroblasts, and the recently discovered fascia sites. In paragraph 5, if you are to cut into the body, you would find two obvious layers of this natural cling film, the superficial fascia, which sits directly under the skin, and the deep fascia, which wraps muscles and organs and connects them to each other. Some researchers, however, extend the definition to include the visceral fascia, which lines the body cavity and divides it into compartments for different organs and also thin layers of connective tissue that line pretty much every part of the body. By this definition, fascia forms a network that pretty much holds us together. In paragraph 6, remarkably until the early 2000s, no one had studied this common tissue in detail, among the first to do so was Carla Steiko, an orthopedic surgeon and anatomist at the University of Padova in Italy. She started studying fascia 20 years ago when her father, a physiotherapist called Luigi Steiko, invented a form of physical therapy called fascia manipulation, which he claimed could treat everything from headaches to muscle and joint pain. His system is now one of many physical therapies that hinge on the idea that fascia can become stiff in that it can be released through massage. In progress 7, since then, she and others have shown that fascia is indeed rich in nerves and that the information that these relay varies throughout the body. Superficial fascia contains nerves that specialize in sensing pressure, temperature, and movement. Deep fascia is involved in proprioception, the body's sense of its position in space, and nociception, the sensing of pain. Because of this sensory role, some researchers say that fascia should be considered a new organ, one that is specialized for communication about the body's internal state. Robert at the Technical University of Munich in Germany recently estimated that an adult's fascia contains approximately 250 million nerve endings, similar to or slightly more than the skin. It is beyond any doubt our richest sensory organ, he says. Others are more cautious. It's possible, but there is a strict definition for an organ to do with material organization, cell types, and function. So it sounds like a candidate, says Lois, but it's early days for making that determination. In paragraph 8, organ or not, there is evidence that the fascia specializes in a different kind of message to other bodily tissues. Experiments in which healthy human volunteers had painful injections into their skin, muscle, and fascia show that while nerves in the skin and muscle produce focused localized pain, 
The network of nerves in fascia is linked to a radiating pain, one that is more difficult to pinpoint. This kind of diffuse pain is a feature of several chronic disorders, including fibromyalgia, which some studies have linked to inflammation in the fascia. It is also a feature of post-exercise soreness, which has long been blamed on damage to the muscle, but which some researchers now think has more to do with injury or inflammation in the fascia. In paragraph 9, the bad news for anyone with inflamed fascia is that if it continues for too long, the body responds by altering the composition of fascia nerves to become more sensitive to pain. In rats, the percentage of nociception fibers, pain receptors that respond to harmful stimuli in the fascia increased from 4% to 15%, following chronic inflammation of the deep fascia in the lower back. In paragraph 10, this could help to explain why lower back pain is so difficult to treat, despite being one of the most common causes of work absence and over-involvement restriction. 85% of cases worldwide are classified as non-specific, meaning the exact cause can't be established. In paragraph 11, given that we now know about nerves in the fascia, the thorax lumbar fascia, a diamond-shaped, multi-layered structure in the lower back in which different layers connect to different muscle groups in the trunk, is starting to look like a good place to put the blame for this back pain. The thorax lumbar fascia is like a big receptor that is able to feel the tension coming from the upper limbs, the spine, and the abdomen, says Steiko. The sensory neurons in the fascia may respond to this tension by registering it as pain. In paragraph 12, on top of nerve changes, inflammation in the roots areola of fascia that is formed between fascial layers can make matters worse. Healing at the U.S. National Institute of Health in Maryland used ultrasound imaging of the lower back to show that people with chronic lower back pain had thoracolumbar fascia that was 20% stiffer than those without this pain. In paragraph 13, injury and inflammation aside, there are many other reasons why fascia may become stiff. Sclave's research hints that activation of the sympathetic nervous system, which is involved in the body's fight-or-flight response, causes the fascia to contract by prompting the fibroblasts within it to transform into myofibroblasts, cells that are part of the inflammatory response to injury, often seen in joint-related problems such as frozen shoulder. In paragraph 14, the detail of how exactly fight-or-flight stress leads to stiffness are being worked out but Sklave says that adrenaline seems to increase the expression of an inflammatory substance called TGF better. This is then stored in the loose fascia in preparation for the next time the body is stressed. When this happens, fibroblasts drink TGF better and they become myofibroblasts in a few hours, he says, and then they are four times as strong as before. They are contraction machines. So adrenaline can make fascia stiffer. In fact, the list of things that affect fascia stiffness is getting longer all the time. Estrogen is able to create a fascia that is more elastic, says Teiko. The fascia is a very dynamic tissue that is able to answer to hormonal inputs, chemical inputs, and mechanical inputs, altogether that defines if our fascia is elastic or rigid. Now moving on to the second article. The second article is talking about the lymphatic system. So in paragraph 15, they say the lymphatic system effectively removes the excess of interstitial fluids, solids, and the various cells and guides them towards the bloodstream, maintaining the volume of the plasma and the interstitial fluids in constant balance. The lymphatic system originates from the interstitial tissue called initial lymphatics. Small capillaries delimited by discontinuous endothelium and basement membrane and low resistance to the flow of fluids and substances. These are hydrophile molecules, cells, viruses, and bacteria. They attach the external surface of the cells through collagen fibrils, which are collagen type 7. This collagen allows the transmission of mechanical forces towards the lumen of the lymphatic vessel. There is an autonomous contraction in some vessels, thanks to the presence of filament similar to actin. These initial lymphatics become wider, creating collecting ducts that consist of collagen, smooth muscle cells, and elastic fibers. Lymphatic vessels have their tone and probably their intrinsic contraction autonomy, according to recent data, with a high ability of sensibility to flow variations. In the brackets, we have sensory functions. They are surrounded by nerves of the autonomous system, mainly sympathetic fibers, which could act to better coordinate the lymphatic transport. In paragraph 16, lymphatic vessels adapt and change their elastic capacity 
improving or worsening the function of lymphatic transport, we can identify primary valves formed by the cytoplasmic extension of the adjacent endothelial cells linked by close connections. The valves of these cells protrude towards the inside. This way, what goes in cannot go out. So I see here they could talk about one-way valves and their imponences in specific vessels. Finally, in the intraluminal valves, which are weaker, are two sheets attached to their opposite side of the lymphatic vessels and connected to zonulars, which are the perimeter junctions involving a band that surrounds the cell. Lymph flows due to external mechanical compressions, for example, the one caused by muscle contraction, and to its intrinsic contraction abilities. In paragraph 17, the lymphatic system is subject to aging, losing its elasticity and creating aneurysms over time or decreasing the number of blood vessels or lymphangions, which are the lymphatic functional unit. Recent evidence reveals that lymphatic vessels are supported by a nervous system of vagal cholinergic type and sympathetic type, able to modulate the contractions of vessels endowed with contractile fibers. These contractile fibers will then act in like protein. These thin nerves reach the external layer of the lymphatic vessel and then reach the deepest endothelial layer. This nerve network deteriorates in elderly people. Probably the presence of both parasympathetic and the sympathetic systems act not only as the tension or vasotone modulator, but also as a sensor of the contractile layer of the vessel itself. So this article is mainly about the fascia. You can see this is the white substance surrounding the muscles of the body. You can see here that white stuff. It responds to pain, stiffness, and chronic lower back pain. So from paragraph one to paragraph two, you need to remember that fascia keep muscles and organs in place. So here they could ask you to define what a tissue is. You also need to remember the composition of tissues of the skeletal system. They could ask you about tendons, ligaments, and cartilage, and how these compositions enable the tissues to perform their functions. So please revisit page 182 of your textbook and talk about the compositions of these and their functions. I'm referring to tendons, ligaments, and cartilage. They wrote about fascia being a sensory organ, so they could ask questions about detection of a nerve impulse, its propagation, and then the structure and functions of specific neurons. From paragraph three to six, again, they talked about tendons, ligaments, bones, and cartilage, so you need to revisit what we talked about here in order to see they'll ask you about their compositions as well as their functions. Then they talked about collagen fibers. So referring to AS, they could link this to the primary structure of collagen and how this enables collagen fibers to have their strength. They could talk about properties of collagen and elastic fibers that enable fascia to be strong and flexible. They talked about actually secretion of molecules from cells. So here they could ask about protein synthesis as well as exocytosis or even endocytosis. They could ask about types of muscles. Remember, we have skeletal muscles, cardiac muscles, and smooth muscles. They could ask about their compositions as well as functions, so you need to know that in detail. They could link this to muscle fibers, so remember we have slow twitch and fast twitch, so you should know how to compare and contrast the structure of these two muscle fibers. Since this paragraph included information about nerve impulses, so remember they could ask about specific nerves as well as how they respond to stimuli. They wrote about the nervous control of muscle activity, so they could ask about how basically the nervous system controls the actions of the muscles, meaning in muscular contraction. So remember, an impulse arrives at the neuromuscular junction, and this leads to the release of calcium ions from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. This is supposed to be sarcoplasmic reticulum, and this will lead to the calcium ions being released. This leads to the onset of muscle contraction. So you have to know the details about muscle contraction involving the actin and myosin. In paragraph seven and eight, they could ask general questions about the nervous system, like detection of a stimuli, it could be pressure, temperature, or pain, then how an action potential can be generated. They could ask about nerve impulse propagation through an axon, then transmission at the synapse. They could include questions about neurotransmitters, then speed of nerve impulse transmission in myelinated and unmyelinated neurons, and then speed of nerve impulse transmission in axons that are wider and those that have narrower diameters. Then another thing, they could link this to inflammation and pain, so remember that. In paragraph 9 to 12, they could connect the effect of repetitive stimulation on neurons because they talked about how they become more sensitive to pain with repeated stimulation. Then they could talk about how neurons respond to stimuli, impulse generation, transmission, and so on. 
then structure and functions of specific neurons like the sensory neurons, relay neuron, motor neuron, and so on. From paragraph 13 to 14, they could ask about the sympathetic nervous system, meaning sympathetic versus parasympathetic nervous systems, then sympathetic versus parasympathetic neurons, meaning they could ask you to compare and contrast their structures and functions. These can be found on page 267 to 268 of your textbook. They could also ask questions about inflammatory response to injuries. I know this is uniform, but a one or two more question could come about that. Then fight or flight response. They talked about hormonal, chemical, and mechanical control of tissue activity. So remember in your textbook, they talk about hormonal control of gene expression. So remember some hormones do enter while others remain outside and cause a second messenger. So for example, adrenaline, which is a peptide hormone, it leads to formation of a second messenger, which leads on to acting as a transcription factor for gene expression so that specific proteins or molecules are produced. So these proteins could be leading to stiffening of the fascia. They could link something to that. And then you remember other hormones like estrogen, which is a steroid hormone. These enter directly the cell, and then they cause or they act as transcription factors, causing the gene expression as well as production of specific proteins. And since from the results, we saw that estrogen causes the relaxation or elasticity in the fascia, so it could be that the proteins produced here or molecules are leading to the elasticity in the fascia. From article 2, here they talk about the functions of the lymphatic system, contraction of muscles and lymph vessels, the purpose of one way valves in lymph vessels, as well as the nervous control of the lymph vessel activity. So paragraph 15 to 17, I suspect they could ask about muscle contraction based on the information you can see here. So contraction in lymph vessels. Here you need to remember that these vessels are made up of smooth muscles, so these have ability to contract. Then they could ask about nervous control or muscle contraction, including peristalsis. Remember, there are specific circular muscles that could contract in order to cause this peristalsis activity to take place. Then they could ask about autonomous nervous systems and control of body processes or organs. So here they could connect the heart and so on, but I suspect this is going to be connected more to the muscle. Then sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems, like we said already, comparing them in terms of structure as well as function. And then the importance of one-way valves in transportation of fluids through vessels. Remember, these one-way valves ensure that movement of substances is in one direction. So this could be blood vessels as well as lymph vessels. So this brings us to the end of the breakdown of the article. Thank you for being with us. Do not forget to subscribe. See you in the next video. Bye-bye.